Okay, welcome everyone. And as people start getting in uh, with their coffee, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Pius Srivastava. So he's from uh, uh, TIFR Bombay. He's in the computer science uh, unit there. And uh, so just a few words about Pius. Pius uh, uh, the, did his PhD from uh, Berkeley and then was in Caltech for some time and then returned India. And now he's an associate professor in the computer science department of uh, TIFR. His main interests are in probabilistic applications in computer science problems. Uh, he has worked on uh, various topics so and various interesting topics. Uh, he has been a uh, speaker in many of our probability meetings. He was an LPS speaker two years back. And uh, today he will speak on some problems regarding Bayesian networks. Uh, Piyush, uh, hope you can hear it. So Piyush uh, could not come because of a teaching schedule. So we arranged an online talk for him. Okay, Piyush, over to you. Yeah. Thank you again for the invitation and uh, apologies again for not being able to come to Bengal. Uh, so, so this talk uh, will be about uh, Bayesian networks and some problems about Bayesian networks. I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, uh, so this is going to be a survey talk. We talk uh, hoping to serve as an invitation to the commenters of Bayesian networks and there will be no proofs, which is uh, maybe both a good thing and a bad thing. And uh, actually, most of the talk is not going to be based on my work. Uh, it's going to be based on a work of a student here, Vijay Sagar. I'll mention some of uh, what I did later, but uh, it's mostly it will be based on his work and discussions that I've had with him. So, so this will be this talk will be somewhat journalistic uh, and will be somewhat light. So, we'll be more focused on listing out problems and uh, what is open and what has recently been done. Okay, so uh, so let me just start with the definition of what a Bayesian network is. Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone is aware of it, but uh, so so very formally, it's a directed acyclic graph. The nodes are random variables, and the information in some sense is contained in the absent edges. And these absent edges, and so the graph could be complete, all edges could be present, but any every absent edge represents some kind of a conditional independence assumption. So here I've just written down an example. I write down the formal definition right below. You know? So I have this graph, three variables, x, y, and z. So here is x, here is y, here is z. And uh, so this is x, y, and z. And um, and the x, y, edge is missing. And that encodes some kind of a conditional independence assumption, which is written down in the equation below, which is so that this probability. So if I just factorize the probability distribution, I can replace the probability of y given x as probability of y. That assumption is encoded in the edge being absent. So let's look at a slightly different. Uh, version. So, so if I change the arrows a little bit from x to y to y to z, now, now the assumption that the change becomes here. So z given x, y changes to z given y. So now the information is contained in this x to z edge being absent. Okay. So, so, so that's, so that's sort of the network is. And so the defining property is the Markov property. So if you take the, if you take the variables, and uh, you take the direct, the directed acyclic graph. This defines the partial the order on the vertices. So the topological sort of just the ordering consistent with the partial order imposed by the DAC. Then every xi is independent of not just xi minus one, like all the pre predecessors, but also all its non ancestors. So it's independent of all non ancestors. Condition on its parents. So that's the diff that's what that's the constraint that a Bayesian network inputs. Okay, so it can be seen as a procedural. Uh, so it's, it's a generalization of Markov chain in some sense. You can go in the if you can take any topological sort, and you can keep sampling the variables one by one in that order because uh, so each variable the conditional probability depends only upon its parents, which have already been sampled, and then you just compute the probability sample that variable and proceed. So that's one way of thinking about it, um, and uh, that's that's the definition. So here, uh, just to say this, the vertices are supposed to, when you, you this be used for modeling things, the vertices are supposed to be subsystems of your system, and edges are supposed to be the causal causal relationships. So that, that's what I was talking about right now. That these edges sort of depend. So you can think of them as basically saying what information does a variable need to sample itself, which other variables must have been sampled. Before. So uh, so any any questions about the definition uh, or this or, or or the notation? Okay, so let's let me continue. 
so uh, so so the motivation for this actually came from causal inference that i would not that i will not be talking about much but let me just uh, give this example because it has to be there in every talk about these so uh, so this is the old pro problem of trying to deduce whether something causally affects some other thing or not uh, and of course whenever you see some correlation it could just be because of some confounding factor so here is one example that there could be a genetic factor that actually influences both a person's tendency to smoke and their uh, prediction to get lung disease. Uh, and actually, this has been argued in hallowed uh, places like quotes that uh, I'll just let you read. So it says that there might be the same thing that causes people to smoke that might predispose them to a disease. Uh, and uh, usually the way the golden um, method to solve this problem would be to do a, a control experiment to somehow remove the confounding edge. So this would be done by actually, I mean, in this case, uh, in a very unrealistic thing of making half the population maybe smoke, the other half not smoke and see what happens and why. Uh, so the notion of Bayesian network sort of arose in trying to get rid of this. So of course, this experiment cannot be done for ethical reasons and practical reasons. So the question was, when can you get, uh, when can you get the same information uh, without doing the experiment? Um, in this case, you cannot. Uh, there are other slightly different models where you can. So Bayesian networks was a formalism to understand when you can and when you cannot. Uh, this part of the story, I will not go into much, but that's the motivation. So this part will be based on just no confounders. Everything will be seen. Everything will be visible. So all nodes will be visible. Okay, so so let's start with the, <laughs> with an exercise. So, so I've written down four models here, uh, four graphical models. And uh, I want to uh, write down the conditional independence constraints that are implied by these models. Okay, so, so what's the conditional independence constraint implied by the first one, the very first one, the one on the left, this one here. It's a Markov chain. The only constraint is that X is independent of Z given Y. So that's my notation for X being X independent of Z given Y. So, so given y, x and z become independent. And this is true in the third one also, which is just the same mark of chain in reverse. Okay, so this is uh, these two. Uh, what about the second one? I probably can't hear, so, but yeah, so as we may everyone knows the answer. So the second, the second one also actually has the same condition independence. So it only implies this one, that x is independent of z given y. The interesting one is the fourth one. So here y has a collider or a v structure. So it is it is a it has it's a child of two nodes, x and z. And the x and z are not adjacent to each other. And now the only conditional independence constraint here is x independent of z. And if you condition on y, actually they, they might become dependent. So somehow these first three models imply the same conditional cons independence constraint. And the third one, the last one, fourth one, is different. Uh, so is that clear that uh, in the third, the last one, um, you know, conditioning on Y can make X and Z dependent? The simplest example is just think of two uniformly random bits. So X and Z are just uniformly random bits and Y is a, is the XOR of them. So if you tell me the value of Y, X, Z, X becomes a function. So, so that's, so, so conditioning can completely just destroy them. Whereas in the other ones, conditioning is the thing that is needed for them. Otherwise they might not be. So this is uh, so this is generalized to this notion of Markov equivalence. So two graphs are said to be Markov equivalent if they entail the same set of condition independence constraints. So in this picture here, these three are Markov equivalent, okay. and this one is in a class of its own. Okay. So there are two equivalence classes, and uh, uh, so in the, so two equivalence classes of what? So if, if I have only these two edges, one from x to y, one from y to z then I can arrange them in possibly four different ways. And this is the easiest four ways here, but the number of equivalence classes is just two. Okay. Uh, and uh, so there's a nice combinatorial criteria for doing this. Uh, so in particular, the deseparation method of Perl, which gives a very elegant combinatorial characterization of what the entailments are. So given a graph, I can tell you all, I mean, in principle, I can tell all the entailments. Uh, what it does in fact is to, given any entail, Candidate entailment and the graph, the deseparation method lets you check whether that entailment holds. So it's actually and it's actually based just on understanding these four examples. So these four examples are sufficient to handle the general case also more. Uh, any questions? Okay. So uh, so so yeah. So so as I said, Markov equivalence uh, is 
uh, so microwave classes are um, classes of Bayesian networks that are that entail the same set of conditional dependence constraints. Uh, and so why is this important? I mean, this is a nice combinatorial calculation, but why would it be important? So, so here is the setup. So uh, here's a motivation from statistics. So if I'm trying to learn the model, if I only have data about the variables, if I have, let's say, the full probability distribution table of these variables x, y, and z on the last slide, then I all I can do is check conditional dependence constraints. So if I only have observational data, I can only check conditional dependence constraints. And because every model in those three class, you know, equivalence class gives rise to the same set of condition dependence constraints, there is no way I can distinguish them using only observational data. So using only observational data, I cannot distinguish, for example, the Markov chain that is uh, that is uh, forward in time versus the one that is backward in time. So the x, y, z versus the z, y, x chain, I cannot distinguish. I also cannot distinguish that from the, the middle model, which is not a Markov chain at all. So to distinguish between the three, I will need to do something just observational data, just the probability table of x, y, and z will not be enough. Whereas to distinguish between the three on the left and the last one, the probability distribution table may be in. It's not necessarily enough. The uniform distribution, for example, satisfy all four of them, but it may be enough. So the issue is that uh, if, if you have only observational data, there's nothing better than the Markov with class. You, you will not be able to go finer than the Markov with class. So, so that's uh, so that's uh, that leads to this kind of a, uh, of a paradigm or view that the size of the Markov equivalence class, in some sense, is a measure of model uncertainty. So, given only observational data, how much uncertainty still remains uh, in the model uh, can be that itself can be modeled as a size of the Markov equivalence. So, is this um, is this uh, okay? Uh, is this like any objections to this or any questions? Any objections? Yes, <laughs> there is one. <laughs> there is one. Yeah. Just a moment, Pimsh. Yeah. yeah. Not an objection for the example that you showed in the previous slide. Yes. Uh, uh, these are the only three uh, possible uh, candidates for Markov equivalence. In the left hand, yeah, so so in this case, uh, in in these four graphs that I showed, these are the only two classes. Okay. So one class is the three models on the left, and the other class. Is... Any further questions? No. You should go ahead. Okay. So 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 now I'll so since there are no options, so now I'll go to the problem of computing sizes. So and before that, let's uh, also look at a little bit about how to did how to represent Markov equivalence classes. So right now I was writing them as sets of graphs, which is what they are. But there should be some in description. So one way to do this might be something like this: that you take the you try to represent the Markov equivalence class as a partially directed graph, where an edge is directed if and only if it has the same direction in every member of the class. So remember, so let me just draw the previous uh, class. So this, it looked like this. Okay, so there are three vertices in these in this model, and uh, and uh, and there are two edges. So let me just draw them and let me see which of them I can direct in the MEC. So let's look at the first edge, this one here, this one. So this one has is directed upwards in one of them and downwards in one of them. So it does not have the same direction in every member. So I cannot direct it. So it remains undirected. The second one also, for the same reason, I cannot direct. So in this case, the Markov plus class is represented just by this undirected graph. Okay, so this this is their class. Similarly, uh, the other the remaining one, which was this one. So this is here. So this one, well, there's only one thing. So this is represented by itself. So this is a possible way of representing an see, where I draw just one graph on the same set of nodes, and I direct an edge if and only if it's directed in the same way everywhere okay so uh, so so okay so so, so 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 not every such partially directed graph would be an mec um, and uh, essential graphs are those partially directed graphs that can represent mecs and the uh, i didn't write in the on the slide but the, the this the commentaries of this was started in the work of verma and Pearl. in the in 1990 
and um, and they give a very nice characterization of when two dab two dabs are equivalent. Uh, so that I will not go into. It's a simple characterization, but I will actually just write down uh, something that came later, which is building upon this Wormian pearl result. So here is that that characterization. So this is the characterization actually of the essential graphs. So so this is this particular. Uh, calculation is from analysis of statistics paper from 1997 by Anderson, Madigan, and Perlman, but very equivalent things, slightly differently stated, uh, were also present in our, uh, around the same time, the work around the same time of Chickering and Meek. So the calculation of Chickering and Meek are more algorithmic. The Anderson, Madigan, Perlman is more, as you can see, it's more structural. I will go through it. Uh, so, so depending upon which proof you are looking at, one or the other might be more useful. So here is uh, what the Anderson et al. calculation is. So it says that a partially directed graph G represents a Markov equivalence class if and only if all the three following conditions hold. So the first condition is it has two new terms. So it's a, it is a, that G is a chain graph. So chain graph means that it is a partially directed graph. So it's it's a, it's, a, it's basically the um, is the notion of acyclicity in a partially directed graph. So this means that there are no partially directed cycles. So if I take any cycle in which at least one edge is directed and all the directed edges go in the same direction that cannot happen that is not allowed to exist so so this is like the so in a directed a cycle graph no directed cycles are allowed to exist here you say that no partially directed cycles are allowed to exist so that's a chain graph and in the chain graph you can then it's not so hard to see that in this chain graph there will be these components of undirected uh, uh, like country components of undirected vertices like uh, so if you just take the undirected edges they will form connected components which will be themselves connected via a DAG. So these undirected components, connected components must be caudal. So, so a caudal graph is an undirected graph in which every cycle of length at least four has a chord. So what does that mean? So that means that the following picture is not allowed. So a square is not a caudal graph because it's a, it has four nodes and this cycle has no chord, although it's of length four. If I add the chord, now it becomes a caudal graph. Okay, so any cycle of length more than four is not caudal. Um, so that's an example of what not a chordal graph. And a chordal graph is a graph in which every cycle of length at least four has such a chord. So a chord just means uh, an edge. So if I take a cycle, a, this, a chord in the cycle is an edge between two vertices on the cycle, which are not adjacent along the cycle. So uh, is this fine? And the next two conditions are somewhat more so technical, uh, but they're interesting nonetheless. So one says that this kind of a sub induced subgraph cannot appear where you have A, B, and C. A and C are not adjacent. A to B is a directed edge and B to C is an undirected edge. That is not allowed. Such a graph, such a, such a thing is not allowed. Further, every directed edge in the graph has to appear as a part of one of the four induced subgraphs. Okay, so, so these, so one of these subgraphs is basically just like two. So basically it says that two is not allowed to happen. And uh, it has to be either directed this way or uh, yeah, it, or the other way, uh, which is also fine. So which is this thing here. So, so you get either a so-called V structure. So this is like a V structure or you get this. You are not allowed to have this. Or cycles, so undirected cycles are not allowed. So if A to C and C to B are present, then so like this one. So this and this are present. Then the only direction possible for A to B is A, is A to B. Because if B to A was undirected, that would contradict the chain graph condition because now I would have a, I would I would have a partially different undirected side. And similarly, the fourth one is uh, similar nature. So so I will not use these things in detail. This is just to say what kind of uh, combinatorics happens here. So these are graphs which have to satisfy these conditions. So they are partially directed graphs which have no partially directed cycles where uh, like graphs of A, this A is the sec graph in second point does not appear. So these kind of graphs don't appear as induced subgraphs. And where every directed edge has to be sort of so called strongly protected. So these, it has to appear as one of these four, as part of one of these four kinds of subgraphs. So this is, this is what an essential graph is. And uh, yeah, and so now, uh, so our, our goal was to count how many, like the sizes of MVCs. So the first problem uh, is to now look at what is the size of an MEC. So the question is just this. You are given a Markov equivalence class G, so it is represented via this, this uh, essential graph. And you want to find the number of DAGs that are consistent with this Markov equivalence class. So you are given this partially directed graph, and you want to find how many DAGs are consistent with this graph. Okay. So this was actually already considered by me. Uh, so, okay, so, okay, so let, before that, let's just uh, look at this. 
so there is uh, so one statistical perspective of this problem could be what is the size of a typical MEC. I'll come to that later. There are some recent results on this also. So so in this typical thing, you're going to ask what does a typical MEC mean? And for at least one notion, there are some answers now in the work of uh, Schmidt and Slide. I'll come to that later. In the paper. Most of it will be most of this talk will be about algorithms. So so let's look at the algorithmic problem. So we have an MECM represented as essential graph, and we want to output the number of tasks that are consistent with this. Uh, G should be M. So this was first con considered by Meek. Uh, it's the same paper that I alluded to earlier, which gave this characterization. And there's a lot of recent work on this, exploiting various properties of chordal graphs. Uh, so there are some references. And the culmination of this line of work is this very beautiful paper of Vinov, Parnak, and Lee from 2021, which gave a polynomial time exact counting algorithm for work. So exact counting algorithms are often usually hard to find because often these exact counting are number P hard. They show that it's actually this problem is in P. Uh, in, for any MEC, you can find the number of DAX constraints in polynomial time, size polynomial in the just the number of vertices in the graph. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a nice uh, result, uh, but um, and it's based on a beautiful augmentation of uh, something called lexicographic breadth per search. I won't say what this is in the class. I would mention something very related called maximum cardinality search later on. Uh, it's a classical tool in the study of chord graphs. It uh, goes back to the work of uh, Rose, Stargen, and Bucher uh, from 1976. Uh, and uh, I would just, uh, especially in this conference, I would like to add that LBFS and its cousins, the ones that we will talk about, they look very much like a preferential attachment version of bread first search. Um, so I'll say more about this later. So, but yeah, so I wanted to say the word preferential attachment. But yeah, they do, they do look like preferential attachment uh, versions of bread first search. Okay, so this is uh, a question uh, and it has been solved. So what's to do? So here is another question that Meek already considered uh, in his paper in some way. So it was that if you model uncertainty given a observational data is roughly to be modeled as size of the marker reference class, then there is something else that can also happen that you might have some so-called background knowledge. So the MEC determines some directions in the graph, but a few more edges might be known to you for, for, for various reasons. You might have done some experiments on your system, which might have told you that some edge. So for example, in the Markov chain example, so I have this. So if you remember, uh, the MEC could not distinguish between these three graphs, right? But suppose someone tells me that uh, that uh, just uh, one of the edges. So like, yeah, actually in this case, it doesn't help a lot, but so if, some, some, if someone tells me that this edge is directed downwards here, for example, so I, I'm, just, I'm just told this information then I know that this edge cannot be directed upwards. It can only be directed downwards. So even by just by giving me one extra, some one piece of background knowledge, the number of, so if this was background known, then this is fixed. So the, the so in this case, just giving me one edge, completely fix the MEs, fix the graph. So it's just telling me that this edge is down is downward, immediately impose the direction of the other edge also. Okay. So although in a, although if it was just told, I was just told that this is actually upwards, then it would not have done so. It would have only eliminated one possibility. These two would have remained. Okay. So so yeah. So, so this background knowledge can have effects on the size of what is what remains consistent in the MEC. And this background knowledge can come through experimental intervention or through domain specific knowledge. Maybe you know that whatever this part represents and whatever this represents, there is no way that the arrow from can go from B uh, from B to A. It has to go from A to B. So if you know that, then you know that the arrow from B to C also has to go from B to C, although that was not part of it. So so yes, so this background knowledge can change the size of the MEC, and the problem does appear to be different. In fact, it's very different. It's uh, uh, so I will say why it's very different. So the problem, but let's first state it formally. So you again, uh, this has to be. Again. So you are you are now given an MEC M and the direction of some subset S of uh, undirected edges in M. And you want to find the number of DAX that are consistent with both this M and S. Okay. So that's the new augmented problem. It's certainly a generalization of the previous problem because S could be empty, then you would have the previous problem. 
And this problem, we know at all in the same paper, they showed that it's number P hard. So that means that it's as hard as counting solution to Boolean formulas, significantly harder than, believed to be significantly harder than just NP hard. So, so this, so just introducing this extra piece of information does make the problem very hard. Okay. So, so it's it is a different problem. Okay. So, 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 so now I can get to my generalistic role. So, so and we meet our old friend with this here. Uh, so, with this I showed that uh, you can somehow sub circumvent this hardness results in certain cases. And here is the main interesting part of his work. So he defined this new parameter, which looks a bit strange at first sight. He says, well, you have this, uh, so this G should be again. Maybe the easier thing to do is to make this. So what he does is that he goes, so you take all the cliques in this graph, uh, G, and uh, so you don't need to know this number. It's, it's, it's just uh, like, so it doesn't actually have to enumerate the clicks, but you take all the clicks in the graph. And for each click you see, you look at the intersection of the click with this set of known edges, this S, and see how many vertices are there in that graph. And then you take the maximum of this number over all clicks. So this is a strange parameter. The only nice thing about it is the second point, which is that it's certainly less than twice the size of S, but it can actually be much, much smaller than the size of S. Okay, so it can be much smaller than the number of background knowledge edges that have been told to you because they might not intersect. The cliques might be small, for example. So, so it cannot be more than the number of words in the maximum peak. And his main result is that if this parameter is small, if this K is small, then you have a fast algorithm or, or at least a polynomial time algorithm. So the algorithm runs in time, it's exponential in K, so it's K factor to 10 K squared. But the runtime bound in terms of size of the graph G is actually just for so it's just four. So, so he shows one way of uh, circumventing this hardness result uh, when K is small. So in, in, any questions about this, these two results, the Vinox at all? So I hear for the first time about this problem and I have a question that uh, yeah. how come that if you know some of the directions, then it is a different problem because uh, if I, if I look at it, okay, we have some, we have some inferences, we may yeah. we have this uh, ages, then, then if we have ages in both directions, then we make it undirected. But basically if we start with a different set of inferences, then uh, why is it a different problem? What in in essence, why is it a different problem? Well, because uh, now I'm putting a, so I'm I, I'm allowed to now add another set of constraints. So I'm allowed to give some arbitrary set of set s. So so MEC is a very uh, structured object, right? It cannot have an arbitrary set of directed edges. So it has to satisfy these conditions that we saw earlier. So here. Okay. So the MEC has to satisfy these uh, very structured set of inputs. So it's the MEC input has to be has to be a chain graph, country components have to be cordial. These kind of induced subgraphs are not allowed to exist, etc. So this MEC has to be like this. This background knowledge can be arbitrary. So I can someone can come and give me some arbitrary selection of selections. Which, so that's how the hardness result actually comes about. You basically encode uh, uh, finding uh, linear extensions to partial orders into this problem via the background knowledge because the background knowledge there's no constraint on it. You might, there's no constraint on which kind of background knowledge you might have. They might come from experiment or they might just come from domain knowledge. You might just know that certain edges are not allowed to be directed in certain ways. So it is a more general problem. It's that even formally, it's a more general problem. And this fact that there's no constraints on where the background knowledge edges can lie makes it significantly harder. This in fact shows up in the hardness results. That's what drives the hardness rate, the hardness reduction uh, for number of the hardness. Rate. Okay, okay, thank you. Any more questions? No, you should go ahead. So, so this harness rule can be circumvented at least in case mod. Um, and uh, here is, uh, so this is a very natural problem, especially from a computer science perspective, uh, which is, 
this is one way of circumventing a hardness result. Another way of approximating uh, circumventing hardness results is to say that, okay, I do not want exact counts. Uh, I don't care whether the number is uh, 1 million or 1 million plus 1. I just want an approximation algorithm, which is, let's say, approximates it to some factor, some reasonable factor. And it's not known, uh, as far as you know, whether there's a polynomial time approximation algorithm for computing the size of NMC. So these things can exist. There are number of hard problems for which there are approximation algorithms to arbitrary, I mean, to any um, reasonable, like, yeah, to say, factor two approximation, factor 1.01 approximation. But if something like this can be done here, uh, it's uh, not clear. Uh, and that's the first open question. Uh, their Markov chain kind of techniques possibly might be helpful here. That they are they are usually the tools of choice for designing such approximation algorithms for other number of hard problems, um, the other sharp hard problems. Uh, and uh, but here I will say a few words about some Markov chain related work in this direction. But it's, uh, it seems to be in its infancy. So so any questions about this problem or? Any solutions to the problem? <laughs> okay, so then I'll move to another class of questions. Question. So, so far we were talking about we're given an MEC and maybe ex some extra information about some extra constraints on what we are allowed to do. And we want to find the number of graphs that are constrained with the MEC and maybe with these extra constraints. Now, uh, another class of questions one can ask, which is how many MEC there are there? So the question is where, um, where are you counting them? So there are many, um, many different ways in which this problem has been looked at. So one way of looking at it is to say that you fix the number of variables. Fix, so in my example, there were three variables. You fix the number of variables and maybe even fix the number of edges that are allowed. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's see. Um, and uh, so and and that has been so, so and so basically you look at these different constraints and try to see uh, how how many MECs there can there be. So there are many different kind of solution concepts you could have come up with and try to study to study this problem. One is to just get exact enumeration formulas, recursive formulas. Uh, so that's uh, some uh, old work. Uh, one other way people have tried to do is to, do this is to sample using Markov chain. So this is the work of uh, AG and you. Uh, from 2013, so, uh, so this is a paper from Panasonic uh, Statistics, so it's there where they propose a Markov chain. And the Markov chain has the right stationary distribution, so it's uniform on all MECs, which are with a fixed number of nodes and upper bound of the number of edges. Uh, they don't have any mixing time results as far as I can make out. They have simulation results that the chain seems to do well, but and it has the right stationary distribution can be proved, but uh, there's no provable mixing time. Uh, Bernstein and Delali have more uh, studies of similar Markov chains. And so the mixing properties of these chains uh, are not well understood. So that's another wide open question um, of probabilistic nature here. Um, and uh, a third way, which is uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about it later, uh, is to compare the number of MECs with. So this is uh, similar to the exact you know, innovation, but you know, it says well, what we'll do is we'll try to compare the number of MECs with the number of all DAGs on N vertices. Now, so this is slightly unsatisfactory in the sense that you're looking at all DAGs on N vertices. Probably your models are more restricted. Maybe they have to be sparse and so on. Uh, but we'll come to uh, these things later. This, uh, but uh, one interesting thing is that all of these uh, things here, all of the proposals here, are about just fixing no numbers, numbers of nodes, numbers of edges, and so on. There's a more natural way, in some sense, is to look at the number of MECs with a fixed skeleton, which is uh, you fix the you fix the uh, uh, Undeaded skeleton. So you, every so so the MEC has the partially under, partially deaded graph. You say that I will only look at uh, the undeaded part of it. So I just remove the directions on the edges, and I get a graph. So that's an undeaded graph, and I want to see how many MECs are there with that skeleton. So just by directing edges in that undeaded graph, and of course I have to follow the MEC constraints. How many MECs can I get? So so is the is the question clear? So, so that's uh, a, a question, uh, and uh, and somehow uh, it has there's not been much progress on this. Uh, Caroline Caroline Arder's group uh, at MIT had some um, work on rest, understanding this in very restricted settings, often in very special classes of graphs, the trees, uh, especially even special trees like paths and so on. Uh, but any kind of general algorithm uh, does not seem to exist. 
and there's some recent uh, work again by our old friend Peter Sagar, uh, who gives the uh, exact polymer time exact counting algorithm for graphs of bounded degree and tree width. And this uh, runtime bound. So what does that, what that means is that his runtime bound looks like the following. There's an exponential factor where the exponent is polynomial in the tree width and the degree. It's something like, if I remember correctly, degree to the three and tree width to the power four. Uh, times the polynomial in the size of the graph, so times g cubed. So this is a, this is a recent thing, uh, and uh, so so that's that's the result. Uh, it's a bit, as you can see, it's not. I mean, it's good in the sense that it's more general. It certainly, so trees are bounded tree width, for example. So it captures bounded degree tree, um, and it works on all graphs as long as they are bounded tree width. Um, but uh, and bounded degree, uh, but uh, slightly unsatisfactory thing is I'll come to that later. Uh, so uh, I just say what goes into this result. Uh, it's, it's it requires a lot of uh, combinatorial heavy lifting. Uh, the initial idea is simple. This is a standard idea of trying to do dynamic programming over a 3D composition of a graph. So you would, you, have, you have bounded tree with graph, you compute a 3D composition and try to do dynamic programming over it. And implementing this sort of requires encoding information. So basically you would have to look at MVCs projected onto these the, the bags in the 3D composition. Um, and uh, then you have to do take this, so this information that you project down, it should be such that it's enough to count the fiber. So basically how many MVCs are projecting down to what you have on just this small thing. But it should be sufficient enough to be enumerated fast. And he does it, uh, so these are two conflicting requirements in terms of, because the information is, should, should be enough to count the corresponding fibers, to, uh, but should also be small enough that you can just go through all possible values of it quickly. And uh, and so so he, he has this notion that he calls a shadow of a Markov class uh, on 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 subsets, and this seems to reasonably well capture this information at least well enough to get this kind of a algorithm, which is exponential in the tree width and degree. Um, the the so other unsatisfactory thing I was talking about is that the exact complexity of this problem is not known. Usually, you will go try to find such an algorithm, which is exponential in tree width, degree, et cetera. If you know that the problem that you're trying to solve is hard, I mean, say at least 10 P hard. Uh, we don't, this problem for all we know might land in P. Uh, it might be have, a, it might have polynomial time algorithms. It's just that this is the best that we know so far. So whether it's hard or what, what are the corresponding hard decisions, we don't know. Um, and again, the same question uh, arises that if, uh, even with, whether it's hard or not, maybe that's a bit hard, but <laughs> to figure out. But again, could we get approximation algorithms that are more efficient than this uh, exponential in tree width and degree uh, uh, algorithm? So, so the situation right now is that you you that the best result uh, for this problem seems to be a result which is exponential in tree width and degree. Um, but there is no complex theoretic barrier preventing a fully polynomial time algorithm. Uh, and certainly not any barrier to getting an approximation algorithm. And it seems like it's a nice question in the sense that even getting to these algorithms requires some nice uh, playing around with uh, the commentaries of uh, 3D compositions and, and the structure of Markov class. classes. So, so there, there seems to be nice commentaries going on here um, and it should be interesting to resolve either of these two um, questions. Uh, any, any any questions about uh, this problem and its status? Uh, yeah. No, Piyush, go ahead. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, so, uh, so let me, uh, uh, so I mentioned uh, this uh, uh, result of Schmidt and Sly uh, very tangentially. Uh, so let me just say what they actually do. So there's a third kind of question, which is, I think, completely open. So at least the current problems I've been mentioning are all at least crisply stated. Uh, here, it seems like even very conceptual things are missing. Uh, so here is their result. So they are trying, they are interested in the question, not in the question of with a fixed skeleton, although I guess the, the same question can be posed in that setup also. So they are looking at the number of Markov stars on n nodes, um, and uh, they want to compare it to the number of DAGs on n. Nodes. So these are all labeled. So you have num So I have not put the word labeled here, but just your labeled MECs, labeled DAGs. Yeah. Also, changing to unlabeled also works, but let's for simplicity look at labeled. 
So, and they show that as the number of nodes goes to infinity, the number of MECs on M nodes, the number of DAGs on M nodes goes to a constant. And it constant is a small number. It's like less than 10 or less than 20 or something. Well, that they don't have a proof of that, but simulations by other people suggest that it's less than 20. And, um, and, and uh, so, yeah, so this is interesting from various ways. This shows that for most DAGs, I mean, it also says that for uh, like an expectation, if you take a DAG, then it's MEC is actually quite small. So these other problems that I was talking about, where these problems were like uh, this polymer time algorithm for counting and so on. Uh, so somehow for most DAGs, those numbers are going to be actually very small. Uh, so if the hardness is coming from the numbers being large, it has to be it has to come from very small sets. So this is often a strange thing. It might happen that the problem is easy on average. Uh, even the counting problem possibly because there are only few solutions. Although that does not guarantee that the that it's easy because just finding those few might be hard. But at least the numbers are small. So for most stacks, the number of elements in the MEC would be also be small because just the number of MEC is not too much bigger or not not too different. And uh, uh, yeah, so 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 that so so that, that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, kind of result. And uh, but there's one again slightly unsatisfactory thing that it, this is uh, talking about all DAGs on n nodes. So so this is a very rich class, right? And uh, it's, it's just uniform distribution on all nodes. For applications, uh, you probably want something a more structured random model, not just all DAGs. So for example, sparse models would be so if you are have if you have Bayesian network. If the Bayesian network is just a complete graph, that's not very useful because then why do you even have the network? It's just an arbitrary distribution. So the network is more useful. So as I said earlier, uh, the, the information in a Bayesian network is contained in which edges are missing. So the sparser the network, the more constraints it is putting on the model. And so sparse models uh, would be more interesting. Uh, so I don't know if their techniques generalize uh, to sparse models. Uh, probably, yeah, it's not clear. Uh, and uh, in fact, a more conceptual question is uh, what are the appropriate random network models for this problem? So what is the appropriate random network model if you want to study Markov reference classes of Bayesian networks? So, so the Bayesian networks are used for modeling things like say genetic uh, it's like uh, gene regulatory networks and so on. So in that in that context, what would be the appropriate random uh, probability distribution that one should put on DAX or Markov reference classes to study questions of this kind? So, um, so this is, uh, so yeah, so this, I don't have much to say on this problem. It's just, uh, this paper is also from, I think, last year. And uh, it's, um, yeah, and uh, before that, there are conjectural works of this kind uh, um, and simulations, but this is, I think, the first uh, rigorous proof of this kind of result. So yeah, but uh, coming up with correct models uh, and, uh, and yeah, asymptotics seems to be open. So any question about this? Okay. No, there's seems okay. no question. Okay, so then in the last few minutes, uh, let me just give a short glimpse of basic techniques, some of the... So of basic techniques that are used in some of these results. I will not get kicked. So I said there are no proofs. So I'll not give any of the proofs. But I'll just uh, mention some of the um, basic uh, chordal graph ideas that go into some of these results. And uh, um, or actually, uh, not even the building box, like the foundational box. And try to justify my comment about uh, preferential attachment. So, so just to recap, uh, uh, these Marco equivalence classes were given by uh, this, these constraints. Uh, so let's not worry too much about second and third, but we had this notion of uh, caudal graphs that uh, that somehow the unrepresented components are these very special graphs which have um, where every cycle of length four must have a chord. So let's just see uh, what these uh, so what about caudal graphs uh, is used often. Uh, so 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 just to recap the definition, of, it's a unrepresented graph is said to be caudal if every simple cycle of length four or more in the graph is a chord. And the chord just means that, uh, so if I have a cycle like this, so this is not chordal because there are no chords. For example, so it must, this this thing must have a chord. So let me, so this thing is a chord, for example, because this is an edge between two edges that were not adjacent along the cycle. So is this graph chordal? It's still not chordal because this is not there. 
this is still not caught and uh, now I think it has become caught. So, so this is the caught graph. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, so 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 that's the definition. Uh, another way of thinking about caudal graphs is in terms of something called perfect elimination orderings. Uh, this name sounds a bit strange. Uh, we will say a few words where it comes from. So an ordering of vertices of a graph is called a perfect elimination ordering. For every vertex, all the neighbors, in, all its neighbors that precede it in the ordering form a clique. Okay. So all the, all the, so I order the, I have to be, be able to produce. So a perfect elimination ordering is the ordering of the vertices so for every vertex. All its so if I have so the graph somehow like if, if I put the vertices on uh, I mean they might uh, so on a, around a line uh, but like I mean this, that does not mean that the line is embedded in the graph it's just an ordering of the vertices then for example it's not allowed that this has parents just this and this because then these two are not unique so if this is the case then this must also be there okay. so so we want this to be a perfect elimination ordering of the graph. Uh, now this is a perfect elimination ordering of this graph, and uh, so okay. So so the name perfect elimination ordering uh, comes from um, uh, trying to do Gaussian elimination. Actually, that's where the name comes from. So if you eliminate orders in such a order, you do not change the sparsity. You do not create new non-zero entries. So that's where the name comes from. That's why it's perfect. So the sparsity is sort of kept. So that's why that's where. That's where some of the interest in this came from, uh, uh, in the algorithms on the in the in the numerical analysis and algorithms uh, literature in the seventies, and uh, and uh, this is a very nice result that caudal graphs are characterized by perfect elimination ordering. So a graph is caudal if and only if it has a perfect elimination order. Um, and this fact actually makes many NPR problems on caudal graphs very easy. So maximum independence with other things, all of these things become very easy because of ex existence of perfect elimination ordering. Uh, not just existence, but also efficient methods for finding them. And uh, so these methods uh, are basically are often modifications of uh, breadth-first search. Um, so the first one was lexicographic breadth-first search is the oldest method um, due to Rose, uh, Rose Dards and one author whose name I'm forgetting. Uh, and uh, another method called maximum cardinality search. And as I said, they look like preference attachment. So in what way? So I'll just say that uh, in the next slide. So, so, but any questions about the definition of perfect elimination or quadratic Okay. Uh, okay. So, so, so let's. Uh, so maybe this is the only technical slide in the whole talk. Um, so about a nice result of Tar Tarzan and Janakaris. So, so they, so this is much, uh, this is at least 10 years or so after the LBFS algorithm, I think. And they propose a simpler algorithm for finding a perfect elimination ordering of a caudal graph. And it's called maximum cardinality search. And here is what it does. This is the full algorithm. You start the breadth first search algorithm for many vertex fix. Fix a vertex V in the graph and start the breadth first search. Now the breadth first search algorithm, we, uh, so like what does it do? You, have, you, you are at a vertex, you put all its neighbors in the queue and then say that this vertex has been visited. Then you pick something in the queue. Um, so the question is which, which what should, like sometimes there will be many words in the queue which are sort of equivalent. So which one should you pick first? So so this one just says that you, when you are choosing which vertex to visit next from those in the BFS queue, you choose the one which has the largest possible number of neighbors among those which are already visited. So let's just uh, break. Or the, the whole sentence has gone missing. Okay. So when choosing which word, so you have so far you have visited a certain number of vertices. Now if there are some other vertices that are in in your uh, uh, sort of candidate vertex to visit next. Among them, you choose the one which has the largest possible number of. I mean, there might be many such. So you choose any one of them, the largest possible number of neighbors among those vertices which have already been visited. And so you keep doing this BFS in with just this extra tie-breaking rule. And this order in which now you words this verse is called a maximum cardinality search order, an MCS order. And the theorem of Tarjan and Yanakakis, which is somewhat not actually once it has been told, it's maybe not as hard, but still requires uh, some work, shows that if, if the graph is cordial, then any 
ordering that such an algorithm produces. So, so of course, this algorithm is not a fully specified algorithm because still there might be many vertices which are uh, which have the same number of neighbors at any any time, any point of time. It says you doesn't matter, no matter how you break ties in those situations, any of ordering you produce will be a perfect elimination order. Uh, so, it's, so, so that so that uh, so so that now it starts looking like this attachment kind of a thing where like you, if you, as long as you attach to more people, so more it's the reverse of that. Uh, you produce a perfect elimination order. Uh, one brief thing I would mention, so I did not say anything about learning uh, and uh, coming to the end. So, uh, is uh, is that these uh, is perfect elimination orderings? So there can be many perfect elimination orderings for a portal graph. And they're not all sort of equivalent for all purposes. Uh, so uh, one thing, for example, is that not all of them are a lexicographic best for search or MCS orderings. So all this, these things are saying that M every MCS ordering would be for elimination ordering and such a thing will exist. But it's not this, this claim is not being made that every per elimination ordering can be produced using this algorithm. Uh, and sometimes it's useful to look at your, this perfect elimination ordering with special properties. Um, and uh, these special properties can become more and more baroque. So this one I would not even write on the definition, but uh, there's some project we had where we were trying to learn Bayesian network. So you have just the MEC and you want to learn all the edges. So instead of counting, you want to see how many more experiments of, of a certain kind we have to do to learn the whole network. And in that um, in that kind of a question, it turns out that a certain kind of information ordering called that we call peak block shared parent. Um, yeah, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, it turned out to be useful. So these are not all not all perfect elimination orderings have this property. And but what we proved is that something with this property would exist. And once you have something with that property, you could do the rest of the learning at all. Rest of the uh, lower bound for the learning algorithm. So these the perfect elimination ordering, the structure of those things is still, I think there's they're still sometimes people find things which are not known. So which um, it is interesting you know, to me because it seems like a very um, clean idea from one side that there's perfect elimination ordering and quadruple taps, but there seems still seems to be some mystery going on inside the set of perfect elimination orderings. Um, uh, and as I think I mentioned this earlier also that the Wienhoff set of their breakthrough result of this getting this polymer time algorithm was actually based on taking the LBFS algorithm and augmenting it sort of uh, sort of like extracting more information from it than it gives by default. And Vidya Sagar's work on the background knowledge thing was then based on taking the Wienhoff algorithm and sort of analyzing it carefully uh, with some modifications to see where exactly its bottleneck is, or what is it, what is making the problem hard for it. So, um, so, so these, uh, yeah, so this this perfect elimination ordering, the structure of perfect elimination orderings in graphs, maybe even random graphs, seems like um, something there were still things that left to understand. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm finishing before time, but uh, let's um, summary. So, so there's several interesting network questions regarding Bayesian networks. Um, so I mostly uh, focused on algorithms for counting and sampling. And uh, of course, there are very concrete questions here, like what are the complexities of certain, some of these questions that I wrote down. But there are also very conceptual questions about which, what is the right notion of, uh, what is the right uh, distribution to study these things if you want to study them in an average sense. Uh, so what's the correct choice? And with this choice of random models, what's the behavior of these problems uh, on those random models? Um, and as I said, this is a very biased, a very biased survey. Uh, this is focused on counting and sampling, but there are a whole host of other problems relating to Bayesian networks. Um, so we're getting to Bayesian networks. Um, so one of them is learning Bayesian networks from data. So this is, um, I partly refer to one work that we had done, but there, this is a very, very active thing with like very different notion, different solution concepts and so on. So too many references to this. This is not a LaTeX error. This is a, I wrote. And, um, and uh, the other one uh, is causal inference. This again, I did not talk about. So everything I talked about where was where all the variables are known to you. Um, the causal inference problem, there will be some confounding variables whose existence you know, but whose values you cannot access. So you are seeing some kind of a marginal of a larger page network. That's your observed data. And from that, you want to do inference of, of causality. And so, on. so this is also a very well-studied uh, well studied problem. Uh, Judy Pearl has also a book uh, which uh, discusses it in at various levels of detail.
it also relates uh, to certain notions in uh, information theory, such as direct information, information uh, some notions in uh, which through which it also relates to things like Granger causality in economics and so on. But there are also some one specific question in this area that I've been studying, in, which is that you can do this theory sort of in a logical way, in a, uh, in a symbolic way. So where you write down symbolic expressions for when you can do causal inference. And when you cannot write down those expressions, you prove that those expressions don't exist and so on. But these expressions in the end have to be, numbers have to be plugged into them. You will be putting probability distributions that you have learned or estimated into those. And these will have errors. They will not be perfect. They will not follow all the condition and dependence constraints that are imposed by the model perfectly. And these errors can accumulate in different ways. Um, and uh, the, so the question is how much, like how do they accumulate? They can accumulate in very bad ways. Um, so that was the content of the first of these papers. And since then, the problem has been studied not a lot, but uh, a little bit in various models. Um, and there are methods to look at what uh, stability is. It turns out numerical stability also relates to graphical stability. So uh, if your model is stable to numerical uh, perturbations of this kind, like noise in the data, under certain uh, assumptions, it's also uh, stable to perturbations in the model itself. Like maybe you have missed the edge and still, as long as your model, your inference process was stable, it will remain stable. So the results of this kind that are known. Um, and so with that, I will end. And so these views can also be, for example, explored in case of random networks. And so, um, but uh, but the story here is still uh, for the stability question is still starting out. So um, uh, so even for the non-random case, things are not fully um, fleshed out. Okay, let's thank the speak. some quick questions okay and uh, thank you for this talk um when you say correct choice of random models does the yeah. learning of bayesian networks from data tell you something about what the structure of these models should be what properties they should have otherwise it's going to be extremely difficult to come up with a good random model right yes yeah, so this is um, Learning from data usually would you would already put some constraints. So you would already say things like the my network is bounded or bounded degree or because uh, you cannot uh, yeah. So 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 so, 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 yes, so it has to do with the stability question also because you will not get perfect data. So you'll get some data. Usually it will be generic. So generic data will not have any Bayesian constraints. So so it's okay. So 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 what I'm saying is this. So suppose your your model was actually very simple, but then you do some measurements. So you will get some perturbation. So you will get some probability distribution, which is actually a perturbation of the correct. Now, so this has become a generic object now. It is it will not likely to respect any of the constraints imposed by your model. It's only suppose it will only be doing this approximately. So the learning problem itself would have to start with some assumptions that the data probably did come from a bounded degree model or uh, or, or bounded tree bit model. So these kind of constraints people put in various theoretical assumptions, or they might have background, uh, they might have their, uh, um, so if they're doing, for example, so there's some things where they're doing, say, weather modeling or modeling pixels in an image, then it has to have some geometric locality of edges. So so these kind of constraints are already put into the learning process. Um, yeah, so. So yes, yeah, so the learning problem, you already put some constraints of those kind in. So the correct choice of random models probably also has to bring in. So so, 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 yeah, so in the correct choice, um, uh, yeah, I should confess that I don't know what would be a correct choice, but uh, the current choice is just uh, all that, which certainly is probably um, too rich. Or, yeah. So there should be something more specific. That's not clear which, which will be the best one. <laughs> Uh, any more short question? Uh, okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again and thanks, Piyush, uh, for the lecture.